We are live. Hello, UK Crime Book Club. As you can see, beaming like a Cheshire cat, I'm absolutely thrilled. What a week I've had, Susan, reading your books. Well, that that absolutely pleases me more than anything, Sam, because it's the one thing that every writer wants to hear, you know, that the fact that you sit in your room all day, kind of, you know, making up stuff in your head and putting it out there in the world. If if readers respond to that, then, you know, that's, that's it. That's job done. So while everyone's um, just clicking play on us and joining in would you like to um, just tell us a bit about the books in the new the joe bolden series and show off the covers if you i can see actually behind you yeah they've got some behind me but i will see if i can hold them in the in the right place this is the first one in the series and it's called she's gone um and this is um I suppose to, to say a little bit different, something different about this rather than just kind of, you know, summarise the plot. This is me thinking, mm, I think I'll write a psychological thriller. I had done one before um, called um, It Should Have Been Me, which actually does feature the character of Joe Bowden. Um, and that was in my previous um, deal with um, a trad publisher. The thing about She's Gone is that... Um, I thought, well, OK, I'll do what most psychological thriller writers do. I'll start with the trope. And the trope I started with is um, the disappearing child. And most of them are um, toddler disappears, mother gets kind of completely freaked out. Mm. Um, and on we go and discover, <clears throat> excuse me, why, what, you know, what's behind it, some deep secret that the mother has, that the family has, whatever. So I started with this trip and I thought, oh, how can I make this different? And I thought, well, the first way I can make it different is this is not a toddler. In fact, this is not a small child. One of the things that, you know, there are various ways in which you can lose your kids. And I'm sure you've had some experience of this yourself, you know. And one of the one ways is when they're 18, they go off to uni or they go to work or they go, you know, they go off into the world to have their own lives. And that is a loss for a parent as well. So the character in She's Gone, Marcia Lennox, um, her daughter goes off to university and she has, you know, she's coming to terms with that. She's dealing with it. Um, but then what happens is that in the in her daughter's, Phoebe's third week at university, she disappears and they, there's no, she doesn't take her phone with her, credit cards, anything. She's her, from her college room. She is just gone. Um, the police become involved and they're very worried about her um, and that's where we start with that particular book um, and how it how it kind of plays out um, has I hope a few twists and turns well as I said to you I am um, audibly gasped at various things so um, I obviously can't tell anybody who hasn't read the books no, but well, I would love to speak to somebody once they've read it oh, I know Kaz has bought it so um Oh, yeah, that'll be interesting oh, to well, talk to her afterwards. I'll take audible gasp. That's good. I'll, I'll do that. um, okay, moving on to the second book, which is more recently out. This is called um, Her Perfect Husband. Um, and I suppose as thinking thinking through this this kind of idea of how you write psychological thrillers, I kind of moved on a bit with that, and I sort of thought, well. You know, I don't just want to sort of cycle through all the tropes and do one yeah. of these, one of those, and one of the other. This time, I'll follow my instincts a bit more and start with character because, really and truly, I think when it comes to stories, character is what matters to most people. Characters are what you remember in a book. Characters are what we all become, you know, attached to. Um, so, I decided to create a female character who was a bit younger than the character in um, She's Gone and um, Sophie Latham is um, a young woman, who, well young woman, young to me I guess, um, she's, she's 39 and um, the biological clock is ticking and she decides very um, very suddenly to get married to this guy that she's fallen in love with, they've known each other for three months she insists against all advice that this is what she's going to do. Um, she's a very successful businesswoman. She's not, she's quite feminist. She's quite tough. She's not anybody's kind of pushover. Mm. 
And this is the story of how she finds out that she's possibly not as smart as she thought she was and is faced with moral dilemmas that really do absolutely kind of crack her wide open. Um, and I, you know, I, I really enjoyed writing that because it was a process of kind of cracking open this character in some ways. Um, so that's my, my journey so far as a sort of psych thriller writer. But I've done other kinds of crime as well. I mean, it started off with gangster, sort of gangster Essex crime fiction. I come from Essex and I think Essex gets a very bad press. So I wanted to write mm -hmm. an Essex gangster novel. I wrote through three of those. Um, then I wrote, um, I wrote a psychological thriller in which the cop that's in She's Gone and Her Perfect Husband, um, DS Joe Bowden, appears for the first time. And that's very much more her, well, it's her backstory. And I kind mm. of think now it's a kind of prequel. I just liked the character of her, of her so much that I decided to carry on with her. Um, but in between times, I wrote a couple of much more police procedurals that are set down in Devon, in the south coast of Devon, which is where I live now. Um, and they were set kind of very kind of close to home. And um, actually, one of the things that we were saying before, before we kind of came on, you said that you'd kind of downloaded um, one of my free stories from my from my website um, and one of those stories which is about these police procedural books is my if, if you like it's my kind of covid story because when um, when we were in lockdown um, I live quite kind of quite near to the coast sort of towards the sort of southern end of Tor Bay when we're in lockdown beautiful place yeah all of a sudden there were all these absolutely gigantic cruise liners literally parked up on the edge of Tor Bay um, at the very beginning of the lockdown because they couldn't get back to their home ports they were completely isolated um, and there were some to start with there were some very big posh American ones I mean real the real real high end of the market and then throughout lockdown we had a whole series of them and I just thought this is so interesting I'm going to write a story about that so my cop who is in the two crime novels buried deep um and close to the bone um gets involved with what's going on there um so the reason i mention that is one of the things i would say is that sometimes with a new writer people people don't want to try your books you know off the bat and i know at the moment you know it's a bit tough you know we were, we're all having tough times so you may not want to go out and, um, and buy a book but if anybody signs up to my website you know they can have these for free because I want to communicate with readers. That's what I'm about. Um, and hopefully then, you know, they, they would get interested in reading more. Well, I, I can say for definite it worked for me because we're talking about the second book, obviously, um, Her Perfect Husband, the, the second book in this new series with Joe. Obviously, um, I need to go back and read the um, prequel one as well, but I wanted to have read this one before tonight. Yeah. So... <clears throat> So I started this one and then I um, I thought, right, I've got some time. I'm going to go and read the first one in the series first. So I read She's Gone and then I downloaded He's Gone from your website, which was um, it's about a half an hour maybe read. It's Yeah, it's, it's, it's the kind of, it's the extended epilogue. I mean, you do need to read She's Gone before it. Yes, you definitely can't read He's Gone you first. Can't read, it is. You can't read it first. It's, it's, um, it's, the one, it's the one to sort of follow on. Because one of the things I think is that when people, when people read a book, there's a, there's a little, I mean, I find this myself, you get to a point where you think, oh, there's a little bit of, I don't, I don't quite want to let this go quite yet. Yeah. A lot of questions in your mind, like, well, what does she do and what does he do? And then what happens? Um, and I sort of thought, well, I kind of want to answer those questions, so I'll I'll write a little um, extended epilogue, and, and basically that's what that is. And it was perfect. Oh, good. I absolutely, it was, you're right, in everything you've just said, it was just what I needed to read afterwards, because I felt so, I don't know what the word is, bereft, you know, like, we, you know, Marsha and Phoebe, um, their story, and... Obviously, Phoebe's gone missing and Marsha's her mum. 
and the, the whole thing there were so many things that I was wondering about and it isn't because it isn't tied up beautifully and she's gone it is you just feel like you need that bit more you know you really want that bit more so that was perfect oh, and then obviously I've been able to move on to her perfect husband and I am I think it was 82 percent in Okay. Obviously, I can't tell anybody else. You know where I'm up to in it because we were talking about it before, already, but can't tell anyone. <laughs> but um, yeah, absolutely love this series. Oh, great. It, it's a firm favourite already. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. So you, um, you've you done all sorts. We've got lots of hello. So hello to everybody who um, who has said hello. Yes. Lots hello of comments and questions. Hello. I have got it open on my phone because it all comes up as Facebook user. So we've got... Um, Kaz, Leslie Lloyd, Jack Probin, Donna Moffat, Dan McBreakneck, Colin Blackman, um, lots and lots of people watching and saying hello. So hello, well, everyone. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. And um, yeah, no, it's it's a very I, I'm a bit kind of new to this whole Facebook Live process because mm -hmm. it's like it's like we're we're sort of on video and we're communicating with people, but not it's not like a Zoom call. I've done a, a few of those over the over the course of the, the, the pandemic particularly. But this is like a bit of a new form to me. And, you know, I really, I really quite like it. You know, it is, a, it is a chance to have an interaction at a time when, you know, we can't necessarily, well, this is going back to the pandemic, we couldn't necessarily kind of be with one another. Mm. Um, and, you know, doing bookshop events and library events and all the usual sort of things, obviously, obviously kind of banned, although I have started to do a few of those again. Um, and so, how's that been? Have you enjoyed that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done um, one bookshop event and one event with the um, Crime Writers Association Southwest. And that was, you know, real life people in real life rooms. And I think it was a bit mm. of shock for us all. We were a bit kind of, oh, my God, you know, hello, everybody. And yeah. it was nice. Um, but I think the thing is now, um, so much of the market is global. It's out there in the ether in on the internet and this is how we communicate in this new world so it's not just a pandemic thing this is like the future mm. and certainly i love it when i get um i get kind of you know emails from readers who are you know in australia or in the west coast of the states and all of that and that is a is that's special i think to have mm. To have the feeling that you can, you know, reach out to um, a much wider world. Um, it's not just about what happens here in the UK, although obviously what happens here in the UK is kind of very important. And that's where you can actually go and meet people. Um, but yeah, um, I'm enjoying it. Good. Um, let me look. In your intro video, it said you worked on Heartbeats. My dad is a big fan of that show, so I'm wondering if that's Kaz. Yeah, but you've worked on lots of things. You've done Holby and Casualty and Corrie and... Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, you know, I've, <laughs> I've, I've been quite lucky because I, I had a career in television which spanned basically about 25 years. Um, I, you know, I started, I was lucky, I got a break in my... 20s um and i went on from from there and i really enjoyed it um and you know i i started that this this tells you how old i am the very first series of casualty that was on um back in the 80s i wrote episode four of the first series as a kind of newbie writer that was my <coughs> excuse me that was my my kind of breakthrough and uh, subsequent to that i worked on a lot of shows um, yeah, Casualty, Holby, Coronation Street, EastEnders, all kinds of things. Um, some cock things, like there was a cock show called The Chief, um, which people might remember. Heartbeat was a big favourite of mine, and I did that mm. for about 10 years until it got canned, which I think I shouldn't probably shouldn't say this, but I think that was a bit of a mistake on our TV. No, I agree, and I, I think a lot of people must be kicking themselves because people are still watching it now. Exactly. It, it plays on a loop on ITV, um, ITV3, and, you know, I've got a lot. I hope nobody's going to ask me how many episodes I've written, because, to be quite honest, <laughs> quite a lot. Um, yeah, so it, it, it plays regularly. But I think one of the things I'd say about the television writing is that it 
was a huge um, advantage to me when I started writing novels. So I've written, I've just finished my 10th novel. Um, wow. Congratulations. But, yeah, thank you. Um, but it was, in television, you need to learn to be a storyteller. That's the big thing. You know, we think about writing and, and people tend to see writing from the point of view of the kind of the words. So they're, oh, well, I'm a writer, so I've got to kind of worry about this sentence and worry about these words. And although that is important, I think the starting point is the other way around, because I think what we're offering to people as authors is we're offering to tell them a story. And that's your absolute obligation to tell people a good story. Um, and what television teaches you is to really understand the structure of story, because if you um, write something and it doesn't work with the audience, then, you know, they're there clicking the remote control, changing channel before you even know it. And that's mm. like, um, but also like with dialogue, you know, um, you work with actors and you hear actors speak the words you've written and that teaches you a lot as well. So when I came into, when I started um, writing books, and it always was going to be crime novels for me, um, I, I've always loved that. And in television, I, yeah, I, had a, I did a detective series, my own detective series years ago for the BBC. I've always kind of dipped in, in and out of that, although I've done things across the board. Um, but I think crime novels are the really interesting contemporary genre, I think because that's where you can get into all kinds of aspects of how we live now. Um, and I guess that's, that's what interests me, people. Why do people do what they can do? I mean, one of my new book that is going to be out in um, um, probably towards the end of September, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, why we lie to each other and the consequences of that. And, you know, that's, that's not exactly topical, is it? But, um, but in, in more, you know, in personal terms, not, not, in, not in the public sphere, because that's a different, different kind of novel, but in personal terms, why is it we feel the need to lie to the people that we're closest to? Because I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And the way that you approach it, you don't only look at it from that side of um, that point of view. You've also explored why people lie to themselves and why they, you know, we can literally see somebody who is currently ignoring red, red flags in this book, more than one person. Yeah. Um, and the lies that we tell to ourselves to be okay to keep our lives steady. Yeah. You know, not to rock the boat. Yeah. We're constantly weighing up, is it worth moaning about that? You know, is it worth talking to that person about that behaviour? Or is it easier just to let things go? And you, yeah, you you can tell just how much you've thought about your characters and how they're acting and, and how that impacts everybody around them because nobody's an island in this book, even though some might feel like they're cutting themselves off and trying to be. Yeah. You know, that's just not human. It's just not possible. And you explore it beautifully. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I think, I, I think in all relationships, I mean, her perfect husband is very much about... Um, a relationship and, and a marriage and how we, when we go into a relationship, what we take into that relationship is our own agenda. And that agenda may mean that we don't see things that we should see. I mean, also, I'm, I, I guess I'm quite interested in psychology. Um, mm. And I think the psychology of, of how we all um, replicate the relationships that we had in our childhood that's you know um, a lot of kind of developmental psych psychology theory is about is about how we kind of construct the world when we were a, when we we're a child and um, you know we take that with us and we quite often we take with us needs and assumptions and habits that don't serve us very well in our adult lives um, and a lot of people who get into trouble particularly in trouble with the law are people who have acquired some kind of quite destructive habit very early in life and have never been able to escape it mm. um, and that's fascinating too because it's like so universal I mean none of us are perfect we've all had stuff happen to us some you know more than others and how you cope with that and recover with from that or don't recover from that or carry it with you or inflict it on other people um, that's absolutely the stuff of psychological thrills. 
Is it quite nice for you now to not have the pressure of, um, you know, sudden script changes and things like that? For It must be a much slower pace to be sitting and writing and doing it on your own terms. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. To have to have kind of choice. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons that um, I stopped being a TV writer, um, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm happy, happy to sort of say this. I, I love television. I had a great time in television. And, you know, I probably would have carried on longer than I did. Um, sadly, I, I became ill. I got, I got cancer. And I just realised that if I was going to survive, I couldn't, I couldn't sort of do that kind of work, that kind of pace of work yeah. anymore. Because it is very much, you know, they phone you up on a Friday night and say, oh, we've got this problem. Such and such has happened. Can you rewrite half this episode by Monday morning? And, you know, it's that kind of industry with that kind of expectation. And, you know, they pay you good money, but they expect you to solve. The writer in TV is at the bottom of the food chain and also there to solve everybody else's problems because mm. it's easier to solve a problem in the script than to solve it in the edit or subsequently. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I was in some ways sad to give up TV, but I just realised, I said to myself, well, this is not going to work for me anymore. So I decided that what I would do is um, write crime novels and go and live by the sea. Um, and that's basically what I've done. And how wonderful. Yeah, so I, I just feel hugely, hugely lucky um, to have got the chance to kind of do that. Um, because, you know, life is can be very short and what happens and what's around the corner, you just don't know. So I think mm. I'm a bit of a kind of, you know, grab it sort of cut well what's the latin carpe deum and not mm. uh, more people with that but yeah, that, that is you know a bit of my attitude to life i guess yeah and i think it's a great attitude to have um i read that you started off as a lawyer and a journalist yeah well, well you can't have done either of those for very long before no um what well, i i didn't i never actually practiced as a lawyer i studied law, a law degree at university and I was going to be a lawyer um, and I was going through the sort of process of um, doing the kind of professional exams to, to do that after university and um, basically I just I, I guess I'd been quite the kind of good girl through my teenage years past all my exams and that sort of thing and my family were very proud of me because I was like the first one in my extended family to ever go to university and everybody was, oh, you know, how Susan's going to be a lawyer and all this. Um, and I came to the conclusion that the practicing law and some of the people who practiced law, it just wasn't me. And it just wasn't mm. what I wanted to do. Um, and so I had a bit of a crisis then. And I, um, I kind of um, put all that aside. Um, but then I got a very lucky break, which was a job as a TV researcher for... London Weekend Television. I went to work for them as a TV researcher. Um, and I did that for, I guess, a couple of years. And, I, you know, that's television journalism. That that was my job. Mm -hmm. all that. And in that process, um, I came to the conclusion that fiction was a kind of more honest trade, if you like. Um, I'm, I made, you know, documentaries um, and some of the things, some of the stuff we got up was, you know, not you know not necessarily i'm um, you know i'm not going to kind of be too specific because yes no we did say that i would stop you if you yeah. went down a certain road so yeah, you, yeah. but <laughs> it was fun i you know i i had a i had a great few years in, in tv um and i started off um with a friend of mine who i'd been to university with we went oh we could write a sitcom um and we wrote the sitcom for Channel 4, which um, very early in Channel 4's existence, and it was absolutely dire. We did not know <laughs> what we were doing at all. Oh, um, no. But that was me kind of crossing over into the idea of, of telly. Um, I actually subsequently um, spent a year in Los Angeles, um, which was... <laughs> equally entertaining I'm, um, you know going to Los Angeles and being totally broke is a kind of interesting experience um, but when I came back from Los, Ange uh, Los Angeles um, I came back with a spec script that I'd written while I was out there and that spec script is what got me 
um, a gig with the BBC and led to um, being involved in the, um, the first series of Casualty when it was just, you know, starting off the blocks. And they took me on as a kind of newbie, newbie writer uh, and gave me a chance. Um, and that was tremendous. And um, that's really, in more detail, the story of how I got into it all. I love that. So you've kind of almost not fallen into it, but found your way into it by separate things happening. And yeah. now you're a writer living by the sea. Yeah. I mean, it's just lovely. Yeah, I, you know, and, and to be quite honest with you, it, life as a writer, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I feel hugely lucky for all kinds of reasons, but it is a roller coaster ride. You know, if I wanted to make money, I should have been a lawyer. I know mm. that, and I knew that years ago. And, you know, they, there are kind of good times and there are very difficult times, and it is an up and down kind of life and an up mm. and down kind of job. Um, and currently, um, I'm, I'm recently, I've, the last two books, um, She's Gone and Her Perfect Husband, I'm publishing those as an indie because the whole publishing industry is changing in all kinds of ways. And I figure that that's the way forward and that's the future. And that appeals to me, I guess, as a writer, because I, am, I, I think I've been a bit of a kind of, over the years, I have a bit of a tendency to kind of kick over the traces. And I certainly did that in my publishing career because the, the first deal that I had, my gangster, my gangster fiction thrillers, um, when I came out of television, um, I was very lucky. I got an agent, got a good agent um, fairly straight away and got, you know, a big book deal with one of the big um, five publishers. Um, and I wrote the first three books and then I thought to myself, oh, well, you know, I've done, done gangster fiction, done that, move on now. What other kind of crime writing can I do? But of course, that's not what traditional publishers want. They want kind of 10 more of the same. And I think I was probably a bit of a handful for them because then I wrote a psychological thriller and then they were kind of, oh, well, you know, they didn't know what to do with me. And I was learning the hard way, the publishing business. Um, and I suppose that's my personality. Um, and the great thing about being an indie now is it is about control. I, you know, I write what I want to write and if I can sell it, then that's great. I can make a living out of it. And if I can't sell it, it's up to me, you know, what kind of compromises that I'm going to make. I'm not being told by a publisher or an editor, well, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. Um, and I suppose at the age I am now, I think, well, you know, I've, I've done enough of that. All the years in television were about you. You are there to, you know, serve the show to, to kind of write what they need, and and that was fine. That was then. Um, but I'm a bit of a kicker over the traces, I think you'd say. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. Um, I think this is Kaz. I'm assuming. Um, yeah, Sam loves your books. Which would you recommend we get started with? Now I know she's already bought. She's gone. Um, but for for well for everybody else who hasn't started yet. Um, well, yeah, I I would say yes. She's gone is is the one to start with, um, because what I've done with these psychological thrillers, which is um, you know I think is is a way of writing a psychological thriller that does have a have a cop in it is that Joe Bowden goes through these books um, and but each book is about a different set of characters so um, a lot of the difference between a police procedural and a psychological thriller is that a police procedural the the cop is the main character the protagonist um, and that's kind of interesting but it does produce some kind of problems which is that they've always got to be you know they're always in jeopardy and this case is the one that really challenges them and everything may go wrong so it's not a very necessarily a very realistic portrayal of, of what the police actually do so i wanted a police character who was much more of a kind of ordinary woman doing a job um and who just got the next case in line but the cases affect her she mm. you know she can't be she can't be unaffected by it, but quite honestly, some, some crime novels 
you know, if half the things happened to the, the main police character that happened to them, they'd have, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and God knows what else. Um, so I wanted to do a psychological thriller where the main characters are always um, the other people who become involved in some kind of crime and become involved with the police. And often the story is about how that happens, what gets them into trouble, if you like. Mm. Um, so, yeah, um, read this one first. She's gone. If you um, if you like it, then read this one, Her Perfect Husband. Um, if you want to go back uh, and look at um, Joe Bowden's previous life, look at um, her, um, It Should Have Been Me. Um, I'm literally writing that down now because I meant to write it down the other day. That is my next one. Um, and I am bringing out a new novel in September. Um, so that will be there. But, you know, um, go on my website and read some free stories. I'm very happy for people to do that. And I think having having the opportunity as an indie to do that, Mm. Um, I think is, is is good because I like it when people write to me and we have a kind of discussion about crime fiction or whatever, you know, the books. Um, yeah. And I'm very excited that once you finish this book, I get to outread it. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Very soon. Well, no, I'm, I'm really glad that you're going to do that. Um, let me do a look. Um, oh, this will be Kaz. Have you seen Sid Moore's campaign to get Essex Girl removed from the dictionary? No, I haven't. No, that's very, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. So Sid is an author. Um, I know Kaz has interviewed her. I haven't yet because this will be like, I'll, I'll be trying to hold on to you so that I can interview you again next time. Right, Kaz okay. holds on to Sid. Okay. So um, she writes the Essex which stories I'm trying to um but obviously it's quite a derogatory term so and well, it is I mean you know the stereotype the stereotype yeah. that there is now of Essex and what I what I tried to look at in my three Essex gangster books is they're not exactly standard Essex gangster books because one of the most interesting things about Essex um and I I live there uh, well I was born there and lived there until I was 18 and then in my middle years I came back and lived there for another kind of 12 years so I know it kind of quite well and what I saw is the way that Essex changed and what you have to understand about Essex is the kind of complete sort of population diaspora that happened out of London post Second World War you know they the east end of London had been bombed a lot of people they knocked down a lot of the the slums and the bomb damage and they started to build big estates out in Essex and there were a lot of those Basildon Newtown Harlow Newtown were all a result of that and so you suddenly had all these East End Londoners kind of moving out into Essex and that's where the whole idea of estuary English comes from because that's the that's the kind of dialect which is an amalgam of the original Essex dialect which is kind of a bit sort of countryish and 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 cockney um, but the other thing that's happened and that has made a huge difference in, um, in Essex is that it, after, after Big Bang, which I'm thinking is like, well, I'm thinking 1987, with the deregulation of the financial markets, people who worked in the city of London, a lot of them lived out in Essex because where I lived, which is a place called Billericay, you got on the train, Billericay, half an hour, you're in the city. So... All the people that lived around me were traders and people in the city. But a lot of them had kind of started off like in the office as kind of office boys or office girls and worked their way up. And so when I went back to Essex after I'd been away for a lot of years in between, um, I went back. Part of the reason I went back is my parents still lived there. So I used to go back quite a lot. And then I went back because my parents were there. Is that the amount of money there was... In, in that whole area because all these people worked in financial services in the city. So you had this, this image of, of kind of Essex girl is, part, is partly kind of based on that, that all the bling and all that, but that's, 
that only sees it in a surface way. It's about what it's really about, the story of Essex is really about, is a whole load of working class people who for economic reasons suddenly had a chance to work in jobs where they made some serious money. Um, and that's what um, Essex comes down to. But hey, I would love to, I'd love to talk to your, um, your author Sid, Sid about Essex. I mean, I'm sure we could have, have all kinds of conversations. About I'm sure you could, yeah. Um, Donna's saying, I love these, my only complaint is they generally aren't long enough. Is that the interview itself, Donna? You have to clue me in a bit. It, it's very hot today. My brain isn't working as well as I would like. Um, Donna's asking, what was your dream job as a child? And what was that? Well, you've, you've already explained the catalyst now for sitting um, and deciding to write your first book. You've covered that one. But is this what you always wanted to do as a child? Did you always know you were going to write? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know so much when I was a child. I, I always did write. I always wrote stories but I think like a lot of writers um, I never I never really thought of that kind of in terms of a job um, because my family background was you know I w was you know my parents had left school at 14 and had to go to work and the sort of notion was well you you know you need a good job that pays you money and that's how I that part of the reason I got into the whole thing with the law but the other part of the reason was that when I was a teenager I used to watch all these shows on television that were kind of like legal kind of courtroom dramas. And I thought to myself, I mean, there was one in particular, I can't even remember what it's called, but it had this like woman barrister in it. And I thought, wow, that is so exciting. I'll do that. Mm. Um, so I was, so it's peculiar really, because I was kind of convinced to be a lawyer by something that I saw on television. Whereas realized, uh, what I realized a number of years later, that actually I was more interested in television than the law side of it. When I sat down to study law, um, I realised that that was it was not quite what I thought it was. Mm. Um, so yeah, I yeah for a while I did dream about being a lawyer, and then the reality of it wasn't wasn't um, what I thought. I don't um, know question. Does that answer the question? Yeah, of course. And yeah, um, we've convinced Donna to add you to her insane to be read pile. Thank and you, Donna. She reads, I, I think she probably reads even more than I do. She must do. Um, and yeah, she did mean that the interviews are too short. And she's been up since four in the morning. So and probably standing near an oven, which is not um, not good on a hot day. I couldn't work in a kitchen at all. Oh, no. Not one bit. No, not one bit. Um, now, I'm wondering if you have a favourite character so far from the Joe Bowden books. However, I realise how unfair a question that is because I'm not sure I can choose. I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I can choose. Um, I mean, I think my relationship with the characters, how how authors explain their relationship with the characters they create, is is very varied. And some people say, oh, well, this character came into my head and they were just talking to me and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, but but I you know my my kind of analogy would be that it's a bit I, I find myself in a situation where it's a bit like kind of going to a party and you don't know anybody and there are all these kind of strange people but they're they're you know it, they're all a bit sort of fuzzy and you gradually kind of get to know them and in the process of writing you kind of get to know them um, mm. you go through a whole journey with them because it is a journey I mean every story is a journey that's the important thing about it it's a journey. For you as a writer and then it's a journey for um for the reader and hopefully you know the reader enjoys the journey in in much the same way as you enjoy it as a writer but when you get to the end of it um these characters become a bit like um friends you once had or neighbors that used to live next door two years ago and they gradually sort of start to kind of fade into the background and then you know you get to the point where you sort of can't quite recall all their names and one of the things I was saying to you before we before we kind of came on was I've really got to sit down and make a list of all my character names because I'm just you know I'm in danger of kind of naming people the same things twice because I've forgotten need a character bible yeah, I need I need much more of a, a, a kind of bible of specific things like that so I don't get too many crossovers um but you know I'm not I'm not very good at all the admin work that 
goes with being an author. So uh, I could procrastinate for a month on looking at different characters and lining them up and using different coloured sticky tabs and oh yeah, yeah I could easily just get lost in that and not actually write anything yeah it, well which is the worry isn't it it is it is the worry um yeah um I think um with my latest book I was saying the other day I, I, I just must sit down now and write a quick list before it goes out of my head because now I'm starting to kind of consider possibilities of what the next book might be and as soon as you get into that, and as soon as you get into those characters, you have to let the previous lot go, um, which is one of the difficult things about doing kind of events and bookshops, because you're always like one or two books behind. And mm. it's, oh, you know, tell me about what happened. Tell me about She's Gone. And I'm thinking to myself, what's her name? I've got, you know, <laughs> I'm not that excited. But you know what I mean? It's, it's, there's the danger of that, I think. Do you have the ending in mind before you start writing? Well, sometimes, um, you know, it, it, it kind of comes to me, uh, stories come to me in a lot, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that that's, that's the thing to kind of enjoy about it. The thing that matters to me most is the characters. Who are these people? What's going on with them? And what's it going to be about? And somewhere in that process of thinking, well, there's this person and that person and the other person, you get to a point of, um, the two important points in the book for me are the midpoint and the ending. And if I've got a good midpoint and a good ending, then I kind of know that I'm good to go. Um, and that's when um, I would sort of commit to an idea, if you like. If I can't think of an ending, it's not necessarily the end of the world. If I think, well, it's going to be something like this or that. Um, and quite often you have quite good ideas. I mean, I have, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think whether or not I've kind of changed my mind about endings halfway through. Yeah, I know, I have, I have. Mm. Because other possibilities kind of come up. Um, that, you know, you, sometimes if you think about it in advance, you think, oh, that's too extreme, that's not plausible, who's going to believe that? But once you get into it, if you're creating characters that are moving in that direction then it becomes kind of more more plausible I think. One thing I do like and I keep going back to thinking about the different characters and she's gone none of them are the same so it's very clear the characters are very distinctive and you write the creepy weirdos you know just as well as you write the people that we adore so it's just I mean, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, and, yeah, just the kind of the skin crawling kind of thing. But it doesn't matter because it's written so well and you know they're not... Say so you know they're not real, but they feel real. So you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about your characters and living with your characters as you write them. So, yeah, it just... To write such a... Um, such a horrible people as well as you know the wonderful but still flawed humans i don't know how you do that well well creepy weirdos is quite an interesting subject and i suppose i should i should kind of fess up and say i have kind of quite an interest in the whole question of um of psychopathy and psychopaths or sometimes we call them soci sociopaths it depends mm. um and the ways in which you know um medical science has tried to categorize these people yet is can they actually be kind of categorized um and one of the th one of the ideas that quite intrigues me about um psychopaths i mean apart from the fa fact that you know estimates put psychopaths at about two percent of the population mm. so not all psychopaths go around kind of becoming serial killers and and kind of murdering people they don't and they don't necessarily they're not necessarily lawbreakers i mean you may have psychopaths who do very kind of laudable things like they might be kind of brain surgeons or something like that but it's about how you view the world and your lack of empathy with other people and to a certain extent a certain amount of kind of narcissism and, and grand grandiose views of, of things i mean there is a whole there is a whole kind of sort of psychopath list of characteristics that you can tick off but I don't 
think that you can necessarily um, put people in kind of one category or the other. It's, you know, there are some people who are a bit that way inclined and some people who are not a bit that way inclined. But one of the intriguing things to me is that I think a lot of criminologists would say, well, if you've got a stone cold psychopath, you're going you're gonna to send them to jail because however much rehabilitation you give them, they're not going to change. They're still going to be a psychopath. And I think that that raises a very kind of interesting question, which is, to what extent is this a sort of part of what is, is kind of in, in the human brain? Um, and to what extent might that be a kind of evolutionary thing that is happening within the human brain? Because if you think about it, in, you know, sort of cavemen times when when we were all, you know, out there on the savannah looking out for looking out for the nearest kind of saber toothed tiger. It absolutely mattered that we had a tribe of other people, other humans to protect us. So we stuck stuck with our tribe and empathy and being able to get on with other people was an absolutely the one thing that meant you were going to survive because you had others to protect you and be with. You move into the modern world and um, quite often the, the biggest source of stress to people can be other people. You know, we live in crowded cities, we, we kind of have an awful lot of um, pressure on us that comes from the size of the communities that we're in. So to what extent could you argue, and this is, this is just a speculative argument, I don't know that there's any evidence for this, this is me as a kind of storyteller kind of going with the story, to what extent could you argue that um, to, to not have quite so much empathy with other people, to be a bit more self-contained and selfish and not affected by other people's emotions is actually going to make you more successful in modern society? That, that capacity to detach yourself is the protection now um, which is the opposite of the protection that you would have needed you know um, in prehistoric times um, and I think that that's a very interesting kind of area of um, speculation and I used that in my in my gangster crime fiction books with the with the kind of main villain if you like in that um, creating a psychopath who, who, who thought that actually it was an advantage. I suppose in that situation for that, that individual, it would be an advantage, but heaven help us if there's ever anybody um, who has lots of power over us who has oh, those tendencies. You know, and I think that's where you get into problems with politicians, because without getting into the kind of contemporary sphere, you can think of quite a lot of people. I mean, you know, in Russia, Stalin, probably most people most historians would agree that Stalin was a stone cold psychopath and you know those kind of people can end up in positions of power and that's where that's where you know things can go horribly wrong. Great for writers and readers not so great in the real world but, but I think the, the less said about that the better. That, <laughs> um, right Donna's made a comment doesn't David tell you off for that Sam? I have a lot of Davids, which which David for a start, and I get told off by all the Davids for everything. So you, you're going to have to narrow that list down, Donna, I'm afraid. Um, Donna's asking which character would you take for a meal or go out for a drink with? I want to go for a drink with Marcia. Yeah, Marcia, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, yeah. I am saying it wrong, yeah, Marcia. Mar Marcia, yeah. I think you could go out for a drink with Marcia. Um... Not that she's a big drinker. She's not a big drinker. She might be horrified by me. Quite, um, she's quite buttoned up. I think, you know, you would find it quite difficult. She would be very charming on the surface, but um, I think you, you would have problems kind of getting... You'd have a challenge getting the guard to drop, definitely. Yeah. But I think with some people, it's worth it once they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think beyond the, 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 the kind of main characters. Um, I in in her perfect husband. Um, I liked um, Sophie's mother quite a lot. I mean, she was a bit mm -hmm. of a Deirdre, yeah, Deirdre. Um, she's a bit of a kind of contradictory character, who um, is somebody who's you know 
had a few problems early on in her life and, and kind of feels like she's made the best of it. And she kind of reminds me of a lot of people in my family, I think, Deirdre, um, that it's that kind of coming from a background where, you know, things are a bit tough. And yet, you know, people who come from tough backgrounds don't all turn into kind of, you know, criminals and ne'er-do-wells. Um, mm. They quite often, you know, in fact, most people actually, you know, struggle against that and turn into something, you know, quite, you know, um, quite a lot better than that. And that capacity to change within society is also really interesting as well. Mm. Um, and I suppose this takes me back to my earlier days of a, of a, as a lawyer. I think when I was studying law and thinking about the law and thinking about criminology, I mean, the, bit, the bit that I liked most when I studied law was criminology, as you can imagine. Um, and you know, it's do we do we believe that people are redeemable, or that quite a lot of people are redeemable? Um, and with the exception of complete psychopaths, then I do believe that most people, um, given the right circumstances and the right support, have the kind of capacity to overcome whatever their demons are and change and become reformed characters. I think we have to believe in that and have a justice system which does promote that. Um, yeah. And given that at the moment the justice system is, is under a huge amount of stress, I think it's important to, to believe in justice still. And one of the things I think crime fiction does is it continually gives us um, resolution and endings to crime stories, which reminds us that it's important that crimes should be resolved and that justice should be done and that that's an important part of our our society we need to keep believing in that you know that's hard yeah to enjoy wish, isn't it? i think i think i won't go down that road anymore <laughs> how do you feel about novels that don't have closure well it depends on what you mean by that um I think the, the idea of, we've talked about this in different interviews before, where the idea of crime fiction versus true crime, for example. True crime, you, you hope that there will be some resolution, some closure, justice will be done. Um, and often that isn't the case. So the argument was that's a lot of the time why people do like crime fiction. So there's a resolution, you know, the baddies are caught, justice is done families can have some closure and move on, all of these kind of things. But do you consider that when you're writing, do you want absolute closure for everybody or is it good to have some kind of open-endedness at times? Um, I, think, I think that people come to crime fiction and come to stories generally for the most part for closure because it's like we want to go through this experience, see all these things, but know that on some level it's kind of all right in the end however it depends what you mean by all right in the end and taking on board some of the ambiguity of life and some of the unfairness of life can work in certain circumstances but myself as a writer i would be a bit kind of judicious with that because at the end of the day although crime fiction ta tackles some pretty kind of hard subjects i'm not trying to depress people if you see what i mean I'm not yeah. wanting people to go away and thinking, oh, my God, you know, the world's a horrible place. You know, these people always just get away with it. And, you know, I mean, if you want to be if you want to be kind of depressed by the world, you know, watch the early evening news. Um, that's not the job of a crime writer, I don't think. I think the job of a crime writer is to explore these things, but to put it in a framework that makes it possible for people to feel um, that it's possible to have kind of resolution and not just of the crime not just that the bad guy gets arrested and taken to court and the police kind of you know win the case or or, or figure it out because we all know in real life that it always takes much longer and is far more complicated than in the in the pages of a, of a novel but i think you know within i think if you write things like psychological thrillers then i think the resolution question is not just about the crime it's about the family and the people involved and 
do they find it within themselves to realise what they need to do themselves to change and to make their lives better and the people around them better? And I think that is more a, a more of a kind of subtle resolution of the whole thing. And I think that really matters. And um, I think readers like to get involved with characters who are full of ambiguity and full of inner conflict, but have at the heart of them some kind of um, sense of what's right on some sort of level, apart from the ones who are the stone called psychopaths, of course. Um, so that's my overall kind of view of it. Um, yeah. We're almost out of time. I'm going to, um, before I ask you to give everyone a recap and tell everyone where they can buy the books, I'm going to ask you one of the, one of my favourite questions to ask, which is your most memorable moments as an author so far. Obviously, you've just finished book 10, or you're finishing book 10. Um, what, what has been really stand out for you? As an author? Um... You see, that you've completely silenced me there, haven't you? I, I, I would pick out a few kind of points sort of through, throughout my kind of life. Um, when I first saw something that I had written, the words that I had written, um, end up coming out of actors' mouths on television. And back then, I knew that the viewing figures were like in the kind of, you know, you're talking... 10, 15 million or more, and sitting down and thinking to myself, I made this up in my head, and all these people are watching this, you know. And they're still watching it. And they're still watching it. I think that realisation made me <laughs> feel, you know, just very lucky, you know, because I know so many people strive to do that and they don't get the opportunity. And the system is not fair. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, Publishers, television people, television producers, all those people go on about, oh, well, you know, good scripts always get made, good books always get published. That's absolute rubbish. That's yeah. Not at all. It's not a meritocracy. It's a market. And it depends on all kinds of factors that have not to do with how good your work is. And a lot of writers, I think, get very damaged by that feeling of kind of not being not being kind of good enough. And, you know, what I've learned in the course of my career is sometimes you're good enough and sometimes you're not good enough. Um, and it's a it's a complete roller coaster. Um, so uh, other other moments, I, you know, I think I think when I got this first book deal um, for, for the informant um, and, you know, um, I had spent quite a lot of time being kind of quite ill and having you know chemotherapy and radiotherapy so it was a, not a very good time in my life and I just kind of come out of all that I got a phone call from my agent who said I've got you a six figure book deal and I was like oh my god I didn't really expect that to happen I would I was kind of grateful to get published you know um so that was another high moment um, but you know finishing the latest book is always a high moment. Getting Being up. a writer, just living by the sea. I mean, how lovely. And, and hearing people say that they read something that I wrote and they gasped. So there you go. That's a high moment. There are lots of high moments. You've always got to look out for the high moments. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that should be something we all keep a list of as well. The high yeah. moments. I like the idea of these, um, these super organised people who have this jar and they'll just kind of write things in all year and then yeah. kind of at the end, you know, pick some things out and have a look. I'm one of the people that thinks that's a wonderful idea, but I've never actually done it. Yeah, and I, I think you've got to take into, into consideration that the human mind is built in such a way that it tends to catastrophize because it's still trying to save us, save us from the woolly mammoths or whatever, or the saber-toothed tigers. And you have to say to yourself, like every day, well, actually, do a reality check. Are things that bad? You know, what are the good things? What are the things I need to be thankful for? I, every morning I run through in my own mind 10 things I've got to be thankful for. Because I think that's a better way to start the day than... What a wonderful idea. ...reading the news. 
<laughs> I'm writing that down as well. Yeah, <laughs> just just simple things like you know. Oh, I could list ten straight away. I'm I'm in no doubt about the, the joy that I have in my life and how lucky I am. Yeah, so exactly. exactly, that's a nice way of doing it. Um, do you want to give us a recap of the Joe Bowden series so far? Show off the book covers and. Um, I'm going to ask if, in fact, I might, mm, if anybody can drop a link to your website in. So let me just find it. Is it susanwilkins.co.uk? Yeah, it that's very, very simple. Susanwilkins.co.uk. If you want some freebies, sign up there um, and you can download them straight away onto, onto an e-reading device. And, you know, hey, if you don't want to be signed up to a website, then, you know, unsubscribe i don't care i'm you know i don't want to hold on to people um unnecessarily uh this is she's gone um which is available and out there um this is her perfect husband which is available and out there i will have another book out in september um if you go to my um website you can get links to all the other books um and um it's been absolutely lovely to talk to you, Sam. It's been so lovely to talk to you. Cows must be sick of me going on this week. <laughs> I've messaged her a lot. Um, oh, that's really nice. You know, no, I think um, I think if I if I can manage to you know do that, then um, then I'm I'm happy. Well, I am going to go and finish her perfect husband. I have, I think I'm, at, I'm sure it was about 80, 82%. So it's really getting into it now. And I'm, I'm just, with the scene that I'm reading, I'm thinking, how on earth, where is this going to go? What on earth? How is this going to, and I can't say anything. Cannot say anything, but it's so good. Well, it's so well, good. That's, that's the best kind of, that's the best kind of recommendation I can have. But hey, you know, when we finished it, get back in touch with me and we'll discuss it. Oh, you're going to be sick of the sight of me. No. <laughs> Or not. No, and and it's it's lovely everybody who's come on and asked questions and um, I'm really I'm really kind of you know grateful for the interest. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you to all of the members and admins for joining us. Um, thank you so much to you for coming and talking to me. And for these books, they are incredible, and um, I can't wait to read the next one. I can't wait to finish this one. But so I'm going to go and hide somewhere with a, a glass of something cold and um, cold, find out what happens great. next. But thank you so much for joining us. No, it's my absolute pleasure, Sam. Thank you. And thank you to UK Crime Book Hub. Thank you. <laughs>